Welcome back everyone. This morning's program continues with Prof. Hartwood Michel, who will talk about how structures of intermediates of the cytochrome C oxidase reaction cycle suggest a revolution. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Oliver Mulakaya. Prof. Michel, please. So, thank you very much. And it's really a pleasure for me to be back here in Singapore. And uh, actually, I work at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics in Frankfurt am Main, Germany. There are about 200 people, and we all work on membrane proteins because we think that the membrane proteins are the most important subject to study. And uh, I show you here a picture of a uh, eukaryotic cell, and everything you see is membranes. So we have a cytoplasmic membrane which surrounds the cell. You have membranes uh, uh, for the organelles, for the mitochondria, for instance. We have uh, the lysosomes, the waste recycling stations. We have the Golgi apparatus modifying proteins. And we have the nuclear membrane where you have the DNA, the library. And uh, what is the problem? That uh, the membranes are barriers and you have to transport substances across the membrane. And uh, including ions, you have active transport, you have passive transport. And uh, also what is very important in membranes that uh, biological electron transfer in photosynthesis in cellular respiration occurs in biological membranes. And this is my major focus of my work. You have already heard about uh, signal receptors. Yesterday, a beautiful talk by Brian Kubilka. And uh, signal receptors like GPCRs, they transduce the signal, amplify it, and uh, amplify it. And uh, what is very important is that 80% of all marketed drugs act on membrane proteins by either in inhibiting them or by activating them. Some uh, of membrane proteins are enzymes, preferentially if the substrate of the enzyme is hydrophobic. And uh, we want to get the atomic structures. This means we want to have the position of each atom, and we want to see the changes of the atom position when the, mem when the membrane protein performs its action. So this is what we call understanding the mechanism of action. And you need that information also for rational drug design or virtual screening, as also was outlined by Brian Kubica yesterday. And uh, so my interest is how to get atomic structures of these proteins. And nowadays we have five methods to do that. So we have X-ray crystallography, mainly due to the work by Max Perutz already in the 60s of the last century. And, and this is mainly what, what I also used. Next method which came was nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which works for proteins up to 30,000. We have electron crystallography. There are only two or three examples that electron crystallography could be used to determine structures of proteins. We have Newton crystallography. I would like very much, but you need a, a neutral source, very expensive, and you also need huge crystals, maybe one centimeter in each direction, because in order to get really diffraction of the neutrons. And nowadays, the methods of choice is single particle electron cryo microscopy. But when I started, uh, when I started in the 70s, the only method was X-ray crystallography. And this caused a problem because the opinion was it is impossible to crystallize membrane proteins. So due to that opinion, people didn't start the project. I never, nevertheless, I tried to do that. And I developed some ideas how it should be, how you should be able to crystallize membrane proteins. For that, I show you here. Uh, a basic picture of a membrane, biological bilayer membrane, with the bilayer of the lipids, with the polar head groups of the lipids on both sides of the membrane, and you have the fatty, you have the fatty acid side chains here, and uh, you have the membrane proteins incorporated, and, you, and the problem is that these they have a hydrophobic surface where they are in contact with alkyl chains, and they are polar where they are in contact with the aqueous phases on both sides of the membrane. And what you have to do is you add detergent soaps forming micelles. The micelles take up the lipids and also they take up the proteins and form something like a safety belt around the hydrophobic surface of uh, the protein. And that's a situation where you start to purify and to crystallize your membrane protein. And I came up with two solutions for how to crystallize proteins, one I call type 1, 
that you get two dimensional crystals in the plane of the membrane and you can form stacks of these membranes and you have something, a very nice crystal, uh, but this was out of reach at that time. I focused on the type 2 where you try to crystallize the membrane protein within the detergent micelle and the major problem is that you have to optimize the detergent micelle in size and shape and chemical behavior. You also have to have some attractive interaction between detergent micelles in order to be able to get a well-ordered crystal lattice. And then you need, of course, need a, a protein and I went to photosynthesis. It's primarily because these proteins are nicely colored, so it's really a joy to work with these colored proteins. And color changes indicate whether your protein is happy or unhappy. And also, you, they are stable and they are available in huge amounts. And I, I took a photosynthetic purple bacterium called Rhodopseudomonas viridis, and it's full of photosynthetic membranes consisting of light harvesting complex and photosynthetic reaction centers. Isolated them and after about three years I got crystals and the crystals and one of the crystals is shown here and uh, what was very nice from the beginning that we could get very nice diffraction patterns and uh, so that's a rotation photograph taken at a rotating anode source in the, in, at home and this photogra photograph films to record the data and you need about uh, 120 photographs like this each taking uh, about 12 to 14 hours 10 to 10 to 14 hours and so it took me to collect one data set three to four months. And you need several data sets in order to find also the heavy atom derivatives. And uh, nowadays we have the revolution, we have synchrotron radiation, we have cryocooling, we have, we have modern detecting devices. And uh, this means now when you go to a synchrotron with a tiny crystal, you get the same data which I do, used to collect in four months within eight seconds. Can you imagine? change from four, three to four months of work to eight seconds. So this is really a really revolution and made the system of now, made, made them much, much faster and you need much, much smaller crystals. And uh, nevertheless, we could determine the, the crystal structure and you see here the photosynthetic reaction, reaction center from that bacteria. And this is incorporated into the membrane. You have two protein subunits. Surprise was the whole structure is highly symmetric. And uh, so the two protein subunits here are derived by a gene duplication from a symmetric reaction center, very clear. You have here a scaffolding protein and here a protein the cytochrome C, which delivers electrons back to the reaction center. If we look to the photosynthetic pigments, we have here the primary electron donor, which is so also called special pair. When it gets excited, an electron leaves the, the, the donor, jumps onto bacteria chlorophyll, then onto a bacteria phyton, then on the first quinone, and then on the second quinone. And this branch is not used for electron transfer, maybe used for light harvesting complexes, but it's still there. Uh, evolution did not get rid of it. And we find this theme in all photosynthetic reaction center course. Now people were able to crystallize and get structures of all different types of photosynthetic reaction centers. And uh, so this is the purple reaction center where they have the primary electron donor, the one branch which is used the other way around. So this is the, the two protein subunits, the L and the M subunit. This is uh, photosystem one, where you have also this kind of primary electron donor, then the chlorophylls and the quinones at the end, and then here you have ion sulfur proteins to go on. And uh, so the cores of the reaction centers are all very similar. And this means that photosynthesis was invented only once during evolution. So I wonder whether this also would happen uh, on, a diff on, a, on a different planet quite far in the universe or how, or how unique this invention of this photosynthetic reaction center was. So, and uh, now with respect to applications, you always ask, uh, can we use uh, photosynthesis in order to solve the energy problem of mankind and to reduce global warming? Because in biomass production, you take out carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and should, should reduce the global warming. And uh, so some basic facts, we have the light reactions called by the light absorbing uh, antenna pigments and uh, the transfer of the energy to the reaction center. And uh, in photosyst photosystem two, you get oxygen, you get water, uh, water splitting and oxygen release as waste product. Then you have the dark reactions where we use the stored redox energy and ATP to take carbon dioxide out of the air and convert it to a sugar. So that's a schematic structure, light reaction, you produce ATP and you produce reduced, uh, 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 you produce an ADPH, which is fixed hydrogen. And then you use these two compounds to take CO2 
two out of the atmosphere in the Kelvin cycle and to produce the sugar. And uh, the electron flow in the global mass and the ionic bacteria is that you have here first for the system two, where you have the water splitting, then you have go on, you reduce plus the quinone to plus the quinone. This goes on to the cytochrome B6F complex. So it gets oxidized again, a very important step because without oxidized plus the quinone, you for the system two cannot operate. And then you get electron transfer onto plastocyanine on the, onto for the system one and the electron back further to NADPH and at the end you generate ATP also why you why, because you generate a pH gradient electric, and an electric voltage so-called membrane potential across the photosynthetic membrane. And uh, but the major point, weak point is uh, Rubisco and uh, because it cannot accurately discriminate between carbon dioxide and oxygen. So Rubisco incorporates uh, carbon dioxide into ribulose 1,5 biphosphate. Then you have your the splitting and then you have a number of reactions when you regenerate the ribulose 1, ribulose 5 phosphate. And uh, you, for synthesis, you, you, you use the NADPH, the fixed hydrogen, and you use uh, the ATP. And uh, the plant enzyme is very sluggish. There's only 3.3 reaction cycles per second. Catalase, for instance, has 10 million uh, reaction cycles per second, and, uh, and it's by far the most abundant soluble protein, which compensates for the, for the sluggish activity. And as I said, it discriminates poorly between carbon dioxide and oxygen. You get an uh, incorrect product, 2-phosphoglycolate. This is degraded using a lot of energy in the plant. And about one third of the absorbed energy of the energy of the absorbed photons is used for the degradation of the phosphoglycolate. So uh, for most plants, 4.5% is considered to be the upper limit of the efficiency of photosynthesis. But in reality, uh, it's less than 1% of the energy of the sunlight, which is stored in the form of biomass. And uh, if, if you go on about what is at the end uh, the efficiency in biofuel production, then biofuels in German biodiesel, which is made from rapeseed, is 0.08%, practically nothing. Yeah? If you go to Brazil and bioethanol, then it's 0.3% of the sun's energy, which is found in the ethanol. Palm oil and diesel is 0.4%, so it's practically nothing. If you, if you would use a photovoltaic cell, you would get 20%. And in addition, uh, uh, with the photovoltaic cell and the electric battery, you have an energy usage in the car by 90%. If you burn diesel, you have a 30%. 70% is wasted, is, is wasted in, the, in, the, in that process, in, the, in, the, in burning the fuel, the gasoline, in the engine of the car. And uh, so I would actually go for photovoltaic cells, put them somewhere here. And I, I read actually that Singapore plans, I had planned to transport uh, sunlight, the energy by electric, by electric cables from Australia to Singapore, which I would like very much, but I, I learned yesterday that the planes were given up. I hope Singapore can revive these plans to transfer energy from Australia to, uh, to Singapore. And uh, so my vision how to, in, how to use photosynthesis would be to improve the Rubisco and uh, you, you uh, would be able to increase the yield of photosynthesis by 50% to 100%. One could try to expand the wavelength range of uh, the plants, of the light which is absorbed. And we also can reduce the photo inhibition, which is a problem mainly in photosystem too. And uh, water availability will be a problem because you need a lot of water to produce the biofuel. We also can change the mechanism of carbon dioxide fixation in plants. The Kelvin cycle with Rubisco, as I said, is very inefficient. And for instance, there's IKEA contain an acetyl CoA carboxylase, which is the most important, the most uh, efficient CO2 fixing enzyme. But this will take a lot of time. So, what has been improved by attempts to, what has been achieved by attempts to improve photosynthesis? And uh, what is already available is that you can degrade the incorrect product phosphoglycolate by different, by different enzymes. And this leads already to a 50% increase in biomass. You can optimi optimize the Kelvin cycle enzymes and you get up to 60% increase in biomass. 
And also, when you increase the P6F complex concentration, which is the one which reduces the plastic vinol and uh, which oxidizes the plastic vinol and gets the plastic vinol back, and so less photo damage at photosystem 2 occurs, and you will have an up to 70% increase in biomass. And what is nice that these increases are additive. So you should be able to triple the amount of photosynthetic yield in the future. And I'm very optimistic, but I don't think we need that uh, for biofuel production. I think we need that to feed the world's still growing population. That's, I think, why that is a very important thing. Now I change gears and I come to the major, uh, to, to the suggested title of my talk. And uh, so we talk about the great oxygenation event, also called the oxygen catastrophe or the oxygen crisis. And it was the most significant extinction event in Earth's history. And it was caused by the invention of the oxygenic photosynthesis by the ancestors of the present day cyanobacteria. And uh, if we have a look on the Earth's history, we learned yesterday that Earth exists since about 4.6 billion years, and life uh, came into existence pretty early, but most likely deep in the oceans, so they had no problem with, with the UV light from, from the sun. And uh, so for the synthesis already, uh, existed here. That was an un, uh, unoxygenic photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis probably about three billion years ago. And, uh, and at the beginning didn't lead to an increase in the ox oxygen concentration because, because there was much reducing agents like iron 2 and sulfides available. They absorbed uh, uh, the, ox the oxygen. And uh, only after, at about 2.5 billion years ago, we, get, we got an increase in the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere to about 1%. It stayed there for two more billion years, and uh, then we got an increase to the 20%, which we have now most likely to the colonization of the land by the plants. And uh, why is oxygen toxic? And uh, I show you here the reactive oxygen species. Here you have the triplet oxygen, which is what we have in the atmosphere. And uh, by energy transfer, you can generate singlet oxygen, happens in photosynthesis and photosystem two which is highly damaging there. You can, can generate the superoxide radical, highly toxic. A second electron, then you get the hydrogen peroxide. Third electron, you get a hydroxy radical and a water molecule. That's the most dangerous species, which you, should, which you don't like to have in your body. And uh, then putting a fourth electron, you get a second water molecule back. And uh, you have to get rid of all these reactive oxygen species. And what can you do? Uh, life could survive in oxygen-free niches. You can remove dangerous intermediates by superoxide dismutases or catalases. And you also can remove molecular oxygen via reduction to water by the oxygen reductases. And nature has invented two membrane-integrated oxygen reductases. One is the heme-copper-containing term uh, heme -copper terminal oxidases, which includes the cytochrome C oxidases of your, of your own body. And we have the cytochrome BD oxidases, which oxidize quinones. And uh, the BD oxidases don't pump protons. They are insensitive to sulfides, and they provide a survival advantage, for instance, in your gut when sulfides are present. And they are also essential enzymes for the pathogenicity of many human bacterial pathogens, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, causing, tuberculo causing tuberculosis. And also some uh, pathogenic E. coli also depend on the availability of the BD oxidases. So we determined uh, the structures of various BD oxidases in our lab. The first one we did by X-ray crystallography, and it took us 12 years to solve the structure. Yeah? And it was uh, two, three students in a row before, before Shara Safarian got the structure. Lousy resolution. Then we used uh, now the cryo electron microscopy. We determined the structures of the E. coli enzyme, that of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and then and the second enzyme of E. coli. And now we have a, a, one more enzyme. And this was done primarily by uh, cryo -electron, electron crystallography. It takes about three to four months after starting the project, so much, much faster. So we gave up X ray crystallography. And uh, now, uh, in the respiratory chain, we have the terminal enzyme, we have the cytochrome C oxidase, use the cytochrome C, and uh, in, order, in, order, in order to reduce the oxygen to water, water, water here. 
And uh, the heme copper terminal oxidase, which include the cytochrome C oxidases, of course have the reaction. We have oxygen, which comes from the membrane. We have four protons from the inner side of the, of the mitochondria or bacteria. We have four cytochrome C molecules, reduced cytochrome C molecules, providing the electrons from the outer side. So we get a generation of a electric voltage, so-called membrane potential, across the membrane. And we also get a pH gradient uh, across the membrane. And in addition, the heme copper terminal oxidases have invented a mechanism to pump four additional protons across the membrane. And uh, this process is not well understood. So we still have to learn a lot about cytochrome C oxidase. We got the crystals, and for that we invented the trick of co-crystallization with antibody fragments. So we make, is, make first uh, monoclonal antibodies against our targets, and then we uh, produce the antibody fragments and make the complex crystallize the complex. Also explained yesterday uh, by Brian Kubelka. And uh, so that's the, the structure which we have. We have here the cytochrome C oxidase from our soil bacterium. And uh, you have here the cytochrome C, which provides an electron first and onto a kappa A. Electron jumps on to a first to a heme A. And then it goes on to, uh, uh, <coughs> to a kappa B, heme A3 complex here, which is actually the binding site for the oxygen at the heme A3, where it is reduced and water is formed. So this happens here. And uh, so what, what I'm going, I'm now focusing on what happens in that part of the cytochrome C oxidase. So what is in this binucleal site? You have here the kappa B with some kappa ligands. We have here a, a covalently linked tyrosine here. And uh, so uh, another group determined the structure of another cytochrome C oxidase. And uh, they published per oxybridge seems to fit the end electron density here pretty well but it's not expected in the oxidized enzyme. Our own work on, uh, on our bacterium actually also showed that by far the best fit is uh, a peroxide in, uh, between the heme A3 ion and the carbo B. So here, here is uh, what, we, what we think is a peroxide. And, uh, but this is not accepted. Now I should say a little bit about the catalytic cycle of cytochrome C oxidase. And actually, uh, what people believe is, of course, you have the oxidized state. You have an iron, formerly plus three, and the copper, formerly plus two. And then you get an electron onto it. You get so-called E state, electron, electronated state. Then you put a second electron. You get so-called R state, where the iron and the copper are reduced. And this then leads binding to the oxygen. And here, you, and then you form the so-called compound A. And the classical first idea was then then you put the electrons from the iron and the copper onto the oxygen, you get a peroxide. And this, is why called, why this is called the P state, having that structure. And uh, then uh, put a third electron onto it, and uh, you reduce most likely the copper. It's called the P reduced P state. Then you, uh, then you this converts to, a, to an oxopharyl, uh, to the classic view and the oxopharyl then. Actually, you put on the fourth electron and the proton, and you get a hydroxide bound to the iron and at the end you come back to the O state. This is what most likely you see in many textbooks. A few years ago, uh, due to Raman spectroscopy, uh, there was hints that actually already here, uh, in that so-called P state, you have already a splitting of, uh, of the oxygen molecule. And for splitting the dioxygen, you need uh, four electrons and uh, they, uh, and they can be provided, two of them can only be provided by the, by the copper and the iron. Uh, one could be provided by the iron generated plus four. And uh, the fourth electron, uh, there are ideas that you might get an iron plus five. You might get a, or might, you might alternatively, you get a, a copper plus three. Or you might, or you might have a protein residue, most likely this tyrosine, which is part of the active side. And, uh, but also, uh, some people also investigate the idea that you have porphyrin radical, you form a porphyrin radical, so the heme uh, A3 itself donates the missing electron, and then you go on that way. So and this is probably what used to be, still is, the most uh, generally accepted way for the catalytic cycle of cytochrome C oxidase. So what we went to try to determine the structures by 
electron cryo microscopy. So we uh, generate the O-state with our enzyme. We uh, collect about 5,000 movies. We get 200,000 particles and get, get, when he, they get here the structure. Then we do the reduced state by chemical reduction, uh, which is supposed to bind the oxygen. And uh, then you get a P-state. P-state you can get with, uh, when you use carbon, carbon monoxide together with oxygen, you form the P-state. And if you add an excess of hydrogen peroxide, you get the so-called FDF state. And we went on to uh, analyze the structures of these cycle intermediates. So, uh, so you, see, you, you, you see the spectra of, uh, of these compounds. Uh, and the <coughs> we, we got all the structures of all these four intermediates. And uh, we could also improve uh, resolution up to 1.9 angstrom resolution. And uh, we, of course, we checked about the, the structures of the intermediate states. And we found low B factors at the binuclear centers, which means that the structure is pretty accurate around, uh, around our binuclear center. And uh, so what we also used was a density modification procedure. So this is uh, the original electron uh, de uh, microscope, the microscopic density. When you do the density modification, you can even see the holes in the density of the vinyl rings. So pretty good resolution. And uh, what we also can see is now that uh, we can clearly see the pathway of, of the oxygen molecules in the enzyme. You have the entrance towards this pathway is located here in the hydrophobic inter interior of the membrane. That is uh, plausible because oxygen is enriched in membranes by a factor of seven. So the oxygen concentration in the lipid membranes is by a factor of seven higher than in solution. And uh, so this is, uh, that is, that, that is here, uh, a part of the, of the, of, of the, of the, of the, of the pathway for the oxygen. And what is also very nice, here you have the entry site, you find a row, a queue of oxygen molecules. So they align themselves and wait for being, for being consumed at the active site. And even, even here, and this is actually here, what, here's the active site. That's, uh, that, that is the uh, heme 3 iron, which binds the oxygen nearby Cabo B. And here, we, that's the last uh, oxygen of the, of, of the queue. And, uh, when you look more in detail, you see the breaching, ox the bre the breaching uh, peroxide, which is this green one here, which is located between the copper and uh, the heme 3 iron here. So and this, is, this is then here the model. And uh, now uh, this is different, a different view. You can uh, how these oxygen molecules uh, lies in, in, the, in, in, the, in the active site. And, uh, this means that we have the dio this uh, peroxide bridge there in the oxidized form, which is not really, uh, really accepted by many people. And in X-ray crystallography, the claim was that it's an artifact of uh, reducing of uh, the X-ray crystallography because X-ray crystallography also produce uh, electrons and you have oxygen around and would, so it's an artifact, but it cannot be an artifact in the electron cryo microscopy. And then we determine the structure of the reduced state and what you see, no density in between the heme 3 iron and, uh, uh, and, and the cover B, which was to be, used to be exact, uh, expected. One of, the, one of these neighboring oxygen is replaced by a water molecule, and all this queue of water molecules is gone because we have, we have reduced, uh, chemically reduced the enzyme with dithionide. And uh, the only significant difference with respect to the proteins that we have. Uh, side chain flipping of a lysine residue. So this is the lysine residue <coughs> here, and this is in the, <coughs> in the, in, uh, 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 is found here. That's in the oxidized form, it have that, has that conformation. <coughs> and if you put an electron then onto, uh, on, 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 on electrons then onto the special, onto the binuclear side, you get a movement of the side chain closer to, to the upper side. And this most likely indicates that the lysine becomes protonated or is protonated, and then it moves closer to the, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to the electrons, which upon the reduction of, of the active site, and uh, indicates that probably the lysine is a proton donor for the water formation there. 
Then uh, we went for the P state, and the P state structure was the big surprise because <coughs> we did not see here the, ex the, uh, the expected uh, oxoferyl, the uh, oxoferyl position. We saw in, instead of that, we see uh, oxygen like uh, density between the heme 3 and the iron. Uh, so this is, this is here the, 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 the model here. And uh, these are different fuels, so we have here this uh, most likely dioxygen compound between the, uh, in the water molecule here, between the carbon B and the iron. And uh, that was probably the biggest surprise because we, ex we expected this oxoferyl there. And uh, so interpretation of that <coughs> density could be a peroxide, could be a dioxygen species, <coughs> And uh, actually, if we believe that in the binuclear center, in the O state, we have a peroxide, then in the P state, we should have a neutral dioxygen because the P state is converted to the O state by addition of two electrons. And uh, so this is uh, what was our preferred interpretation now. If we go on for, for the F state, you see, we see here that we have uh, actually a density which also for dioxygen molecule or uh, near the carbon B, bound to the carbon B now. And uh, according to the expectation, the student originally modeled it as an oxoferyl, but this is not convincing. And uh, so we did an, another uh, model modeling. And this is when you do the, mod the modeling for the absence of an uh, oxoferyl. The problem here is that if you model here the uh, oxo for, o, o, oxo, oxygen atom bound to the iron, the distance here becomes too short because you displace the, the iron atom to this direction and this uh, gets too short. And this now looks much nicer and we have here that uh, what we believe is a superoxide as a ligand to, uh, to the carbon B and there's a water molecule in here. here. And uh, from inorganic chemistry, uh, <coughs> we learn that when a carbon plus one meets a dioxygen molecule, we get a carbon two plus superoxide complex. So we suspect that this, this density here, there, is a superoxide. And uh, we also have other evidence for that, because when you generate the F state, that is seen here in, the, in, 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 in uh, that part of the slide, absorbs light at 582, and when you add catalase, then you, the, H, the F state actually is reduced, and you get this new state, and this new state looks very much like an O state. And uh, we, get, we convert, by addition of catalase, we convert the F state to an O state. And uh, this explanation is, and, and this is most easily explained by the presence of the superoxide in the F state, and uh, if the superoxide takes an electron from cytochrome C oxidase, it leads also to the appearance of a tyrosine reticle, located on tyrosine 164, that we know. And the peroxide, which is released uh, uh, from the enzyme, is, is, uh, is split by catalase. And this then gives the uh, optical feature of the oxidized, uh, ox the oxidized form of cytochrome C oxidase with a ferric heme A3 ion. And uh, so we have a most likely scenario for the second half of the catalytic cycle. The P state contains a neutral dioxygen, no oxoferyl, and it is an oxygenated oxidized state. And addition of one electron then leads to the F state. And upon this, the bound dioxygen is converted to a superoxide. And uh, <coughs> the F state does not contain uh, an oxoferyl, but a ferric heme A3 iron. And if you add another electron, then you get the O state and you have, you have the bridging peroxide, so which makes complete sense. So we can phrase it differently, and this means the P state actually is an oxygen in the O state, and the O state is the P state. So uh, this sounds confusing. <laughs> and uh, so our present model of the cycle is set. We have the R state. Here, iron plus three, copper plus two, you, you bind the oxygen here, you get the P state, then you get the electron, you get the F state, which can, can turn into superoxide, 
Then you put on a second electron, you get a peroxide bridge, and then we have to go to the, to, uh, to the E state. That is, I think, the most dangerous step because uh, when you put an electron onto peroxide, you get the OH minus radical, and you have to prevent it somehow. And we have to think how this is prevented, uh, how this is prevented. So we do some experiments, and uh, but our uh, E state is not, not so clear for the moment. Uh, and one idea was, of course, maybe you have to rotate the catalytic cycle simply by 180 degrees and you are back. But this seems not to be true because the E state is no, also no indication for an oxophile. So in order to get the E state, we treat the F state side from C oxidase with carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a two electron donor. But uh, as I said, uh, our cryo M structure appears to exclude the present oxophile ion in the BNC in the binuclear side center. So it's not a 180 degree of the cycle. Of course, uh, with that revolutionary proposal, we get a lot of criticism. Now we have to find our model and go on. And uh, I have to, of course, to acknowledge to, to, to the people, these are the people working on cytochrome C oxidase. Jürgen Köpke did the X-ray crystallography. Florian Hilbers did bio, uh, biosynthesis of the enzyme. Uh, how she did, did lots of chemistry, and it was uh, Iris von der Hocht who discovered the conversion of uh, the F state to an O state by addition of catalase. And, uh, and uh, for the intermediate states, intermediates of the catalytic cycle, it was mainly Felix Kolbe here, together with the help of Shara Safarian, who was also responsible for all our PD oxidase structures. Uh, of course, we need a highly competent. Uh, Electron microscopic facility, which is uh, now which is now used by Sonja Welsh, and originally it was set up by uh, Derek Mills, but he unfortunately died a few years ago. Uh, and uh, but we we could close the gap with uh, Sonja Welsh, and uh, without this know-how, our work would not have been possible. So that's the end of my talk, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We now invite Prof. Mulakaya to moderate the uh, Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Michel, for, for this great talk that first told us about the potential, uh, you know, the big picture of how one may be able to improve photosynthesis, and then demonstrated to us how um, getting this very detailed atom atomic knowledge of uh, membrane complexes is actually able to translate into very, very precise um, uh, mechanistic knowledge uh, about, about life. So um, maybe I'll just uh, take the first question. Um, I, I know that you mentioned that it, it is amazing, right, that uh, pho photo photovoltaics can be 20% efficient and plants are only maybe 1% efficient. But of course, there is this caveat that anyone can take a seed and throw it on a bit of dirt and put some water, and then you have uh, an energy conversion machine of 1%. Anyone can do that, but if you want to achieve the 20%, then indeed you need an industry, you need to be able to uh, produce a lot of photovoltaics. So do you believe that humans will be able to overcome the challenge to make photovoltaics actually um, you know, a feasible option to generate all this amount of energy that we require? Oh, yeah, oh, that's already there. The calculations have been done, and actually, it's not a, a, a huge area which you need to uh, generate all the electricity uh, which is required uh, in, 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 in uh, which is required in the world. Of course, in Europe, there has been this Desotec initiative, uh, where you generate uh, electricity not only by photovoltaics but also uh, by mirrors focusing light onto tubes which are filled with some liquid, salty liquid, which is heated up to 400 centigrade, and then you, via steam, uh, you generate uh, electricity the classical way. And this uh, has the advantage that you can store the heated uh, liquid also during night, and do, so you get elect electricity generation also in the night. And uh, this was called Desertec Initiative, and uh, it was supposed that you uh, transfer the electricity via this uh, High voltage, <coughs> uh, uh, high, high voltage cables to, uh, to Central Europe and solve our energy problem. Uh, this has been given up, I don't know why. But actually now the British, they are trying to get a cable from Morocco to the UK, to United Kingdom, about this 3,000 kilometers. So you're, so you're optimistic? 
I'm very optimistic yeah. that this will, will work out. And my idea is that you have to stay electric as long as you can, because each conver conversion into chemical compounds, you lose a lot of energy. So I don't believe that hydrogen is the big future, because uh, you waste too much of the primary energy. Yeah. Um, we'll take a question up, up there. Ah. Yeah, thank you for giving your nice talk. Uh, my name is Dong Seok Kim from South Korea. Uh, I have a simple question about the chloroplast part. Uh, as you know that uh, there are so many organisms uh, having a photosynthetic membrane, such as cyanobacteria and algae. So I was wondering why did you choose the purple bacteria to uh, analyze the structure of photosynthetic membrane? Uh, because they are very easy to grow, have a very simple composition. And these reaction, uh, reaction centers, they are more stable than, for instance, photosystem 2 or photosystem 1 from the plant. Yeah, it's, it's much easier to, uh, to get them. They are more stable. And uh, for the system two, we have also heterogeneity uh, and, uh, and instability. Actually, I thought when I solved the purple reaction center, that I should be able to work out the structure of for the system two as an emeritus yeah? after retirement. <laughs> but actually, uh, uh, the uh, speed the field developed was much, much faster than I expected. And for the system two was solved beginning of the 2000s. Thank you. All right, so uh, we have a question uh, online, uh, which I actually like. It's, it's uh, what is your view on the super complexes? Uh, do you think they are real? If so, what could be the advantages of forming them in the cell? And the, uh, uh, this, this question is by Sahutso Inwong Wan uh, from Thailand. It refers to observations of uh, these, these complexes in the membranes that appear to form, uh, you know, to be in spatial proximity. Uh, the super complexes are real, there's no They're doubt. They're real, okay. Uh, real, and if we have the super complexes, we have a pretty short distance for the diffusion of, uh, for the diffusion of the quinols, and also uh, cytochrome C doesn't have to move, uh, to, move to move a lot. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but actually, it's not absolutely required. They, they are, st they are uh, investigations by spectroscopy telling you that uh, still uh, complexes are pretty mobile. Hmm? Is there a data oh, there. you can you can mutate to stop formation of supercomplexes? Has that been uh, looked at? Uh, quite often you need cardiolipin for also you know the cardiolipin yeah. in order to get these uh, these kind of supercomplexes, and so you, without cardiolipin you don't you don't get much of these supercomplexes, and uh, uh, in some examples you have uh, the cytochrome C covalently bound to the B6 B6F complex to the BC1 complex, yeah. so and so this cannot diffuse. A, a, over low distance, so the cytochrome C oxidase and the, BC, and the BC1 complex have to, has to be close together mm. if you have uh, the covalent attachment of cytochrome yeah. C to the BC1 complex. Um, we will take another question uh, up here. Hi, uh, um, this is Ting from uh, New Zealand. Um, thank you for the detailed explanation about oxygen pathway and a mechanism for uh, using this uh, enzyme to catalyze uh, um, oxygen uh, reactions. Um, so, uh, considering the high promotion of hydrogen fuel cell cars nowadays, um, so I'm just wondering if you um, and a lot of researcher, researchers are, do, are carrying out uh, um, uh, research about using this kind of complex or enzyme for electrocatalysis to enhance the oxygen reduction reaction. So, um, uh, which is an important part for high, uh, hydrogen fuel cell. So, I'm just wondering if you have any comment about the future possibility of using this, um, com this kind of complex for um, electric catalysis? Uh, I don't think that biology uh, proteins can help you much because they are not so stable. So the inorganic materials are much more stable and much better, uh, and much better suited for this kind of applications. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, of course, you, uh, for you, you need this proton, conduct, uh, proton conducting uh, membrane, things like this. Yeah. And uh, biology cannot compete. Yeah, yeah, yeah understand that. Unfo okay. Unfortunately, I would like <laughs> that our work in biology to uh, to, uh, can help to solve these problems, but I'm not optimistic there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I just feel like, um, considering like my own experience, I found the efficiency as like. Uh, quite low and the stability is quite poor. So, wondering, um, just curious about your comment about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will take a question up there.
Hi, um, I'm Juanita, a PhD candidate in plant science. Um, I was wondering that how can you see uh, in the future to grow these kind of modified plants since we try to adjust or try to improve the abilities of the enzymes, but still the plant needs um, another factors like um, fertilizers or water to grow the plant. So do you expect to see this kind of plant growing around everywhere on the earth or uh, how yeah. do you think about that? Of course, uh, you have to analyze what is the limitation for the growth plants or the growth of the, of, of the algae. And uh, in reality, we have, I think, two major problems. One is water. You have to have sufficient water. And the other point is that you, most often you need to have a limitation of, of, of nitrogen. Yeah, so you have to, have to add nitrogen. And uh, I don't think it's a good idea to, uh, to convert the plants into nitro, in nitro, nitrogen fixing. And to have, because the uh, yield of nitrogen fi fixation is low and you waste a lot of energy. And if you look around, what is the biomass production of nitrogen fixing uh, plants? This means, of course, it's the bacteria in, in, in the nodules, in the roots, which produce the plants is pretty low. And so the yield of biomass in nitrogen fixes is not good. Yeah? Uh, yeah? Thank you very much. Um, so we have now run out of time, unfortunately, for, uh, for the session. Um, so so th thank you very much for, for, <laughs> okay. for your, for your you. seminar. Thank you.